<clears throat> Hi, Tara. Um, I was interested to hear you call torpor an energy, and um, <laughs> because honestly, uh, I completely get the grasping and aversion causing suffering. But at least to me, those have an energy to them, and there's something I can work with. I honestly feel personally, my suffering is mostly I, I'm bored, I, I'm, I'm heavy, I, I have torpor, um, mm -hmm. and that doesn't seem to have any energy. So, and it's not that I'm falling asleep when I'm meditating. In fact, I don't really sleep all that well, but yeah. just a lack of engagement. And yeah. So, yeah. Uh, Anything sure. I th it's, I, I'm glad you're drilling down a little more because there's a lot we we could explore about these um, universal forces. Um, so if you consider sloth and torpor or sleepiness, and you say, well, what makes me sleepy? You know, and one reason might be we've just been working hard and we're tired, and that's just you just say, okay, well that's it. You know, I'm tired, and you take you find time to sleep. Another reason is that sometimes um, we come to meditate and it's quiet and we're still and we're so in the habit of being go, go, go and here's a quiet, peaceful room and there's some part of us that goes, oh, it's quiet in here, it must be bedtime, <laughs> you know? So there's this, this kind of reflex to kind of, that's a second reason. A third reason, and this is where I'm going with this, is that often, um, Sleepiness is a way of, of covering over something we don't want to have more contact with, something that's raw. And that's why a lot of times people, depression, it's, a, it's, it's actually a psychic energy that is pushing us down some, is kind of, kind of shoving under uh, the parts of our psyche that we really don't want to experience. That's when it gets a little interesting. You know, and, and and boredom has a little bit of a different energy. It's it's kind of a, a restlessness that's got a version under it, where there's something. It's like we don't want to be present, we don't want to be with what's right here. So there's this kind of restlessness. It's trying to find something more. Something's missing. You know, it's kind of trying to find something else because now is not enough. There's a sense of not enough. So the invitation is to take whatever version is presenting for you, because I'm sensing that you can feel in it, there's something in it that wants attention. Deepen your attention and, and sense how it feels in your body. Sense if, if you gave that energy a voice, you know, what is it believing? Sense what that place in you needs or wants. Like, just keep inquiring. This is not a... Um, it's not an intellectual investigation, it's a felt sense investigation. Do you know what I mean by that? Oh uh, yeah, sure, that, and that's definitely an, an issue for me. I'm very conceptual and analytical, and um, so this is definitely emotional. And, it's uh, definitely a what? An, emo an emotional kind of thing, or maybe even a lack of emotion, but... Um, or a covering over of. It's, uh, it's your way of moving away from emotion? I, I guess, it, it eludes analysis, so... Which is good. <laughs> we want it to elude analysis. So what I'd like to invite you to do is explore it in a, an embodied way. In other words, feel how it feels in your body. And you can ask it questions like, what are you wanting, what are you needing? But keep coming back for the response in your body, which means neck down. Okay. And let me know what you find. Okay, I'll try. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Yeah. Hi. Hey there. Um, lately, I've been uh, setting intentions when I wake up in the morning, and I've been talking to a lot of other people who are doing the same thing. And um, sometimes it's really small, little tiny intention, and sometimes it's something really huge that's been bothering me. But sometimes I sit down and I, I just can't focus on what would be the intention for now. And sometimes there's just so many. I'm like, well, what, let's see, what I have set an intention and meditate for 15 minutes and then would I set the next one and you know like sometimes there's just so many things that I want to I realize meditation solves so many things I thought I was going to forget my question so while I was sitting over there I just meditated for a couple seconds on like for a minute maybe what my what my question was going to be so I could remember to ask you and it worked it worked 
<laughs> mm, mm. So w what I'm hearing as your question is, what is a good way of reflecting on intention when there just seems to be too many and it's kind of scattered? And one of the things I found about intentions is that they're very, very layered. And so there's a whole superficial level, like imagine an ocean with a lot of waves, and some of the waves are, wa are really wanting, you know, I want to get a lot done today, that's my intention, you know. <laughs> the depth of the intention, how deep it is, comes out of presence. So if you notice there's a mess of them kind of all on the surface, that's an invitation to you might let go of the inquiry about intention for just a bit and just say, let me get more here. And let your breath calm you down, you know, slow, long breath, kind of bring your energies really into your body. Just feel yourself right here so your senses are awake. And then ask again and ask it with, with the kind of interest that's like, so what really matters to me? You know, what... What is it, you know, and sometimes I'll, you know, at the end of your life looking back or, you know, what, what would have mattered about this moment or this sitting or this day. So you get sincere. Mm -hmm. And the sign of having tapped into a deep intention is sincerity. You'll feel it's a felt shift in the body. And I sometimes consider it's kind of like innocence. You, you just feel very clean with it. And that's a different kind of intention than the multiple intentions that are hanging out on the surface. Then you've dropped into the, the oceanness of being and you sense the deep longing. And I, for me, intention always has to do with some quality of presence. Mm -hmm. It may be that there's a direction of that presence. I want to bring presence to this relationship or this project. But Intention always has to do with coming home to presence in some way. Hmm, yeah. So I hope those are tips that help. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, thank you. You sort of have to set your intention to figure out what your intention is. You're exactly <laughs> right. Actually, it is very circular. You have to be present <clears throat> enough to remember that presence matters. And when you remember that presence matters, then you become more present. So it is mm. definitely a looping. Thanks. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Hi there, Tara. Hi. Um, well, first of all, I've been coming uh, off and on here for, uh, for a few years now, and I also read your book, and uh, the experience really has been transformative for me, mm -hmm. and I've been meaning to thank you for a long time, so I wanted to thank you for that. Thank you. Yeah. Um, my question is, I'm kind of curious with someone like yourself that is so practiced in meditation, you know, what is your experience when you're meditating, when, not maybe in this environment, but when you're at home in a quiet place and you're meditating, I'm, I'm curious to hear what your experience is like. Mm -hmm. what, what, what maybe I'm trying to evolve to eventually. I, I, know, we shouldn't, I, know, I know that we shouldn't be trying to strive for something. Um, but, but I'm just curious to understand what someone like your experience is. <laughs> I'm here, I'm, my computation is how much confessional I... <laughs> um, yeah, because I, I felt my discomfort of, you know, that I'm on some other level. Because, you know, I've done it for a long time and I, I still work with the same five that I just named, you know, where I get restless sometimes or sleepy or wanting something more, you know, so the... Um, so there's a real range in my experience. Some days um, there's a lot more of becoming the quietness, just stillness, openness. Um, so there really is very little identification with the narrative. And often it takes um, some time. It's not like there's, you know, I'll find, I'll find as time goes on that, um, oh, I didn't realize I was living inside that story. So 10, 15 minutes and it's really, and then, oh, that's right. <sighs> Still, you know, so, so there's a settling process that is pretty much happens every day. And I use different um, pathways to arrive in stillness. Sometimes I will collect around, you know, just as we do here, just, you know, relaxing through the body and waking up through the body, sometimes listening to sound, sometimes qigong through moving, you know, so there's different practices. 
But the abiding components that are always there is that there's um, an intention simply to let go of all doing, and that's a key thing, because for many years I had all these different techniques, but, and I could engineer myself to fairly tranquil, concentrated, open states, but they were somewhat manufactured by the technique. And the shift that's happened in recent years is that at some point the doing drops away. So there's a much more spontaneous, natural kind of awareness that emerges from that and more trust in that. And, and I, what I found in working with people is that it takes some intention to wean ourselves from our practice, our formal practice. Does that make sense? Yeah. So we use it with a light touch. You know, use the concentration on the breath or use the, okay, now I'm going to listen to sound, now I'm going to sweep through the body, now I'm going to do metta. But then let it go. And let, if there's an intention, it's just purely to rest in beingness, to let go into beingness. So that would be where the shift in more recent years has been. And with that, um, there's a natural quality of love that comes with that awareness when there's no doing at all. Yeah. So I hope, I don't know if that is what you wanted. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Hi there. Thank you. I've been trying to be more mindful in just my everyday life, and I'm happy to say I've dropped my cell phone many fewer times now. Um, <laughs> just being more mindful in detail. Mm -hmm. But the one thing I have noticed is that I'm just observing more so the language that people use around me and, and language that I use myself both internally and externally. Somebody I overheard say this week, that's an observation, not a judgment. And that's a common phrase that you can hear sometimes in our language. I'm just curious to know what really differentiates observation from judgment because people do say things of that nature. Is it the intention? Can you tell in yourself when you're, let's say, with somebody that you care about and they're doing something that um, you know causes them suffering, could you tell the difference between noticing that and having it be an observation? Oh, this behavior, this is, is leading to this, you know? and having it be a judgment where you're not only noticing this is causing suffering, but that there is an aversive quality in your body about it, that this is wrong, it shouldn't be happening. I can definitely sense the body language among folks, especially if they're being critical of others. So, so you, you can tell in yourself the difference. Yes, and, and in myself too, when I've said things in the past, I mean, if they were judgmental, it was, there's a, a difference in the way that it feels, it resonates inside. Right, so, what your, your question is such a good one because it's a whole area of practice to start noticing the difference between simply observing something and what do we add on to the observation? Whether it's about ourselves or another person. We might observe, you know, I might observe myself um, speeding around and not very open-hearted. So what if I just observe that and say, okay, I'm speedy and my heart's kind of tight and numb, versus observe that and saying, and I'm, I'm supposed to be a spiritual teacher, I'm supposed to be feeling sensitive and tender when I'm having a conversation <laughs> with this person, and instead I'm just trying to get it done so I can, do, you know. Sure. So if I add on, I shouldn't be like this. That's the difference between observation and judgment. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Hi. Hi. Th thank you for this opportunity. Um, I come here about uh, once a month, and I keep thinking, gee, I really should uh, establish a practice <laughs> at home. <laughs> and, you know, there's always a competition of things. Uh, you know, one of the chief things uh, being uh, work and sleep. Why might it be so hard for me to start doing this uh, at home and uh, what might help? Ah, it's, it's a great one. Thank you for bringing that into the room. It's, you know, in all the spiritual gatherings, that's the elephant in the room, is that there's some 
underlying assumption, well, if we're really serious about this stuff, we'll be practicing. And how many of us either aren't practicing or have a sense of it's not enough or I'm not really, really investing in it? Let's raise our hands. How many of you have some evaluation that's judgment, not observation? <laughs> okay, yeah, okay. So here we are. And for those of you that um, are, are listening, that was most of the room that raised their hand. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, so it's really challenging, and, and if, I, if I had to say, um, you know, what might, exp I'll, I'll say what I think kind of explains it, but then I'll, the strategies that can work, which is that, you know, we've inherited a survival brain that um, has us geared to be vigilant, and that um, has a default network that as soon as we start moving towards presence, starts getting stirred up, and looks for the future and looks to the past and tries to reconstruct a self-reality that, that gives us orientation because we feel unsafe and vulnerable and so on when we're just resting in meditation. So we've got a lot of conditioning to not choose to stop doing. We've got a lot of conditioning to not choose pausing because in those moments we are no longer using our false refuge, we're no longer protecting ourselves, we're no longer accomplishing things. All our strategies to feel better, you know, these substitute strategies we're hooked on, we have to put aside. So there's a lot of conditioning against it. And I think it takes a lot of support to do it. I think that one of the reasons that through history people have gathered, spiritual people have gathered, whether it's in monasteries or in, you know, tribes to, to sing or dance or whatever it is, they've gathered together because we have a deep intention for it and our shared, our collective energy helps create a kind of gravitational field that makes it easier. So it's easier to come on Wednesday night, hey, we're all here, we're doing it together. Or to listen to a podcast where you sense there's some energy that you're plugging into, than to stop our world and pause on our own. Does that, does that make sense? Yeah. So one approach is to find others to sit with, but that's, of course, not realistic if we want to have a, a daily practice. So what I found worked for me was this. I, I was kind of lucky because I, when I was 21 or 22, I moved into a spiritual community. So for 10 years, every morning at 3.30, a group of, you know, 40, 50 people would gather, and I got very into a habit, a very good habit. But then I moved out of the ashram and immediately had a baby. So I went from very conducive to very not conducive, like that, you know. So I found for a few months I was kind of wobbly on, on my practice. And... Um, really missed it. And so I made a, a commitment that I've kept, and, and I really invite you to make this commitment, which is to practice every day, no matter what. Okay? And there's a back door. Okay? There's, a, there's an out on this one. By practice, I mean formally create some space and time that you're dedicating to paying attention to presence, okay? That's what I mean by practice, some formal time. It could be practice while you're walking slowly or walking fast, but you're intending presence. It could be practice while you're lying down. It could be practice in any posture. It could be practice in, in movement, qigong or yoga. But the key thing is that it's every day because nature likes rhythmic cycles and there's a remembrance that starts occurring when every day we meet ourselves in that way. It's a gift to the soul. It's the most precious gift you can give is to create a pause each day where your intention is to come home to your own being. Now, the back door is that it doesn't matter how long, okay? So, for me, back to my story when I had an infant, um, sometimes, my, you know, my husband would be with, with Narayan and I would, you know, go back to having, you know, I usually sit for about 45 minutes or whatever. But there were many days that it just didn't happen. I was back to seeing clients and this and that. And, 
And at the end of the day, I'd sit kind of, I'd be at the edge of my bed and I'd close my eyes and I'd take a few breaths for a few moments and then I'd say, you know, may all beings be blessed, may all beings be happy, may all beings be free, clunk. And that was it. That was my meditation. But it counted. <laughs> so I want to say that to you as an invitation that you can do that. You can give yourself that gift. It's, it's something, there's not one of us that can't do that. Because it's, it's, it can be short. But it's a little bit of a trick because once you do pause, there often is a part of you that says, wait a minute, just stay a bit. Just stay. Let's, let's make friends. Let's be in the moment. Let's connect. Or there's some curiosity that wants to say, well, what is it like right now, really, to be here? So. For me, I'd often say, okay, I'm just going to sit for five minutes today because I just have too much to do. And then I sit and then I end up staying for longer. So that's one possibility you might experiment with. Thank you. Hi. Hey there. Um, so I'm going to try to general, generalize this to the general audience as much as I can. Um, so I'm taking on a project that I've tried to do many times in the past successfully, but it's ended up not so successfully. And each time I sit down to do it and to try to succeed, it like I'm overwhelmed with feelings of doubt and I guess like flashbacks to how I've not done well. Um, and I was wondering how do I get past that how can I use mindfulness to, you know, deal with, you know, to try to make it a new start. And okay. My white whale is the GRE. I'm sorry? It's the GRE. Oh my gosh, the GRE. Yeah. You okay. <laughs> know that one. So, uh, first of all, I want to thank you for your question. And I'm, I just took a look at time. So this is going to be the last question. So I just want to say, say thank you and I'm sorry to those that were willing. And... Um, just take a, a few moments with this. It's an important question because there's not one of us that doesn't know what it's like to feel a sense of fear of failure and to, and to have marked from the past the times that, that we didn't come through, whether it's to do with a relationship or a test or work or something, a diet, whatever it is. So we carry the weight of the past into the moment as evidence of what's not going to work. So the, the question I, I feel, I, I'm hearing from you is when that storyline is, is circulating in your, in your mind, how, is it, how can you use mindfulness with it? The first step is to pause enough to just fully acknowledge, okay, the failure story's back. You know, there's the voice in the brain saying how, it's not, how I'm not going to do well. It's almost like you're taking a picture frame and putting it around it and saying, okay, so there's that, that, that story of failure. And, and, and feel in your body what it feels like, you know, when you listen to that. But get really awake to the fact that the story is going on. Because if you can name a story, if you can name a fear, it doesn't have as much control over you. And they, they found, the shaman put it that way. They say, if you can name a fear, you basically have some freedom around it. And now in research studies, MRIs of the brain, as soon as you start naming what's happening, okay, fear thoughts, failure thoughts, um, there's a shift in where the brain's activated, the limbic system's not as activated. So that's step one, is to name it, come into your body, and then just start breathing long and slow, just real conscious breaths, with whatever you're feeling in your body, just keep a com keep a company, and then offer yourself some prayer. Like, may I, may I trust in my capacities after you've calmed it down some? Okay, frame around the story, come to the body, breathe with it, and then offer yourself a, a blessing, and see how that goes for you. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Does that make sense to you to do? Do you have a? Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you. So this is, I, I just want to really um, give you all my appreciation because part of, part of my thanks is to those who stood up, but also 
there's some sense of um, safety and, and good-heartedness that makes it possible for people to ask questions, and I, I could really feel it here. And it's in that spirit I'd like to close the evening, if you will, just to have a chance to um, come into the moment. I invite you to close your eyes. So much of what we've been exploring tonight are the different things that keep us from presence, whether it's judgment, fear of failure, sleepiness and how we come back home again. So just for these moments, feel your intention to be fully here. And notice if it's possible to relax something in your body and relax something in your heart so that you can rest more fully in that here-ness. just to take these moments to honor the wakefulness that's right here in your own being, the consciousness, that in you which wants to wake up, to know truth, to love well, just to honor that, offering whatever blessing you'd like inwardly right now, whatever resonates, whatever blessing you'd like to offer to your own heart right now. With sincerity, with care. And then just widening the attention to sense all those that are sitting here all those that may be listening and tuning in to the same field of presence, of care. Just sense that you can hold all of us in your heart. And that this shared heart space can spread out in all directions, everywhere. So that we sense all the insanity of the world, the political, the violence, the greed. And we also sense the potential, the heart potential, the goodness that can bring healing and peace to this world. May all beings everywhere discover and live from loving presence. May there be peace on earth. May there be peace everywhere. May all beings awaken and be free. Namaste.